Hello, my name is Kim Larsen, and it's my pleasure to present our paper, Synthesis for Motivated Games with Branching Time Winning Conditions. So the work is joined with uh, Isabella Kaufman and Yeri Saba. So in the teaser to this presentation, I talked about our ambition to disrupt model-driven development to go from simulation through model checking to synthesis. Let's try to understand these concepts a bit more precisely. So in model checking, we have a model here, a quick structure uh, and a property, temporal logic property here, a CTL property. And the model checking problem is to decide whether the model actually satisfies uh, the, 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 the specified property. Now, as an intermediate step towards synthesis, we have the satisfiability checking problem. So here you're merely given the property of interest. And the question is whether there exists um, a model satisfying that property. Now, finally, the synthesis problem, you have a game version of your Kripke structure. So here we have, um, we have uh, controllable transitions. So these are the full transitions here and uncontrollable transitions. Um, and the question is whether now there is a strategy for the controller in terms of uh, which of these controllable transitions should be chosen at, at, at which point, so that under that strategy, the resulting behavior will satisfy uh, the property of interest. So in the paper, we are pursuing um, this model checking and synthesis challenge in a weighted setting where we can talk about things like uh, energy consumption, heat, heat, heat production, uh, timings and bandwidth and, and things that could be of interest, say in an embedded or psychophysical system. So the basic model here that we, that we look at is that of uh, Kripke structures, but extended with weights. So we have states here, you'll see a, a task scheduling process that can be idle or processing in a fast mode or in a slow mode. Um, and on the transitions, we have uh, added uh, uh, vectors of weights of natural numbers. So here pairs of number of tasks completed and time units spent for that particular transition. Now for the specification language for our, our uh, to specify logical properties, we are not directly going for a weighted extension of CTL. Rather, we are, we are introducing a rather very expressive recursive weighted modal, U, uh, modal logic, uh, very, very similar to the modal U calculus that exceeds CTL in expressive power. So we have a finite set of variables here and for each of variable, we have a defining uh, formula. So there will be an equation system defining in a simultaneous person manner all of these uh, all of these variables. So these defining formulas are given by this syntax here. It can either be a conjunction, a disjunction, or a basic uh, formula, where basic formula are true or false, atomic propositions, or you can have uh, these kind of properties where you have uh, a weight expression that is compared to some threshold uh, constant or you have these existential or universal next step modalities uh, with suitable resets so we can talk about, we can talk about uh, cost and cost uh, accumulation of cost. So for the semantic interpretation, um, we have that each formula will be satisfied by a set of configurations and the configuration is simply, is simply uh, pairs of state and um, um, uh, a, weight, a weight vector. And the semantic is pretty much a denotational semantics where the set of configurations satisfying a disjunction is just of, uh, that of the union, uh, given by union. And, um, and uh, another example could be that the set of configurations satisfying these uh, threshold properties are just all the configuration where when you evaluate the, uh, the weight expression E under the weight vector W, you actually meet the threshold uh, bound given by the constant C here. Now for, these, uh, for this next step, existential next step modality here, this, here we are essentially quantifying existentially over uh, the successor states of, this, uh, of a state. Uh, more precisely, it's all the configurations where there is some transition out of the, out of the state um, so that the resulting configuration where we, are, where we have, of course, the resulting state as, as, as a state component, but with the weight vector now being updated, um, first of all, being, being reset in all the co coordinates that are mentioned in R, and having done that, we add uh, the cost vector of the, of, the, of the actual transition. So in this way, whenever we look at a subformula in phi with some configuration, 
we actually have at hand in this in this in the weight vector the accumulation of weight in all the coordinates uh, um, all the way back to the to the uh, you know to the to the most recent reset of that of that coordinate. And for the recursive variables, uh, the idea is simply that uh, this uh, that um, their semantic will be the maximum set of configuration that makes that their defining equation true. Uh, so here you see some interesting, uh, what could be some interesting, uh, um, some interesting uh, properties. So you can, with this strange recursive formula, express that it's always the case that the produce exists seed never exists 15 within two time units. Uh, or maybe a little bit more understandable, uh, this recursive formula here expresses that uh, that um, for all path eventually uh, phi will hold, and this is guaranteed to hold within uh, a bound of four in terms of the second uh, weight uh, coordinate. Now I'm not going to attempt to explain why why why, why these recursive encodings actually specify that, <coughs> but but it's a very expressive logic. Uh, now, of course, comes the question as to uh, decidability and complexity of model checking. And here, the first challenge is that we have infinitely many configurations. But uh, what you can do is that whenever you have a configuration with a weight vector, you can cut that weight vector down according to a maximum constant that you see in the in the equation system. So, so, so there will be formulas there, and there are finally many constants being mentioned. You take the maximum of that. And then you can cut down the, the, the weight vector according to that, to that maximum constant. And this lemma here says that when it comes to checking whether a configuration satisfies the formula phi, then this is exactly or completely equivalent to checking whether the configuration where you have cut down this weight vector according to this maximum constant satisfies the formula. And there will only be finally many uh, uh, configurations now when you apply this cut. Uh, that you need to look at. Uh, so we have decidability. Now there will be exponentially many such, uh, such uh, configurations after cut, and that's why that on that basis we can provide you with this uh, exp time complete, completeness result. Uh, and for the lower bound here, we have a, in the paper a reduction from countdown games uh, that you can have a look at. Uh, okay, so Let's now move to the to the more ambitious goal of doing uh, synthesis. So here we are we are extending or we are we are adding to our weighted Kripke structure uh, uh, that of having controllable and uncontrollable moves. So we are in a game setting. So here in our task scheduling uh, process problem, the controller in the idle state can can choose to either go to a fast uh, fast processing mode, where or to a slow processing mode. And in the fast processing mode. It's now up to an antagonistic environment to choose uh, between these two uncontrollable transitions. In, in both cases, you will have two tasks completed within one time unit, but what is the difference is that there might be, uh, is the amount of heat that, it, that, uh, that is being produced that could be uh, either 10 or five. Okay, so that's, that's our, our, our game scenario on which we want to play. And now, uh, as control objectives, of course, we have properties expressed in our recursive weighted uh, modal logic. So um, it could be a conjunction between these two objectives. Uh, this one expresses that there are never produced more than 15 units of heat within two time units, the property we saw before. Of course, if that's all you want in life, then always operating in the slow mode would, would suffice. But maybe you also want to be, to <coughs> be a little bit demanding on, on tasks to be completed. So maybe you also want, in addition to that, that it should always be possible to complete four tasks within two uh, time units. So now the question is, can we find a strategy that, uh, when, uh, when added to this game, will satisfy the conjunction of these two properties? But what is a strategy? Well, a strategy is, uh, of course, a choice that the controller needs to make in a given state, but based on whatever could have been the history. So a strategy sigma takes a history up to the current um, state, and uh, based on that history, it will point to a, a controllable transition that is enabled in that in that in that current state. If there is such 
a state enabled. Otherwise, returning nil of the strategy is also an option. And for these, for the, for, for these properties that I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, uh, you can check that what, what I try to define here is actually a winning strategy. So what does the strategy say? Well, it says, mm, if, you're, if, if you're in I, okay, so you're in idle, then it's okay to operate, to, con to, to go for the fast operating mode, provided, and let me just say what this means in word, provided that the immediate preceding step did not exceed more than five heat units. Okay, so it was not heating too much. If that was the case, then it's okay to continue the fast processing mode. If that, if the previous step, immediately pre uh, preceding step was um, um, producing more heat than five, then uh, you better go to the slow processing mode. <coughs> okay, so, uh, but how on earth do we, do we um, decide whether there exists such winning strategies? Um, so here um, we use, um, as we have done in many other contexts, so we have a, we have a tool called CAL where we can do bi-simulation checking and, and model checking of finite state systems. Uh, and the universal tool there is that of dependency graph that was introduced by Liu, uh, Liu, uh, Liu Xingxing and Scott Smolker in 98 to, to offer a uniform way of dealing with many of these uh, interesting equivalence and model checking problems for, for finite state systems. So a dependency graph is a graph where you have nodes that are, that are understood to be Boolean uh, valued. So, uh, and out of each node, there will be a number of hyper edges. So uh, from this node X here, which X will be Boolean valued, uh, out, of, out of X, there is one hyper edge that essentially expresses that X should be equal to the disjunction, uh, to the, sorry, to the conjunction of Y and, and Z. Out of set, there are two hyper edges. So this should be interpreted as a disjunction over the possible hyper edges. So this is saying that set should be equal to the disjunction of Y and Q. So you can also put it in a different way. A dependency graph describes a, um, describes a Boolean equation systems, um, a, a, a Boolean equation system of the variables that, that, that are essentially the nodes of the Boolean of, uh, in the dependency graph. And now what is, a, is of interest is to find truth assignments to these, to these nodes or to these, uh, to these nodes in the, in the graph that will make all these equations true. So there can be maximum assignments in terms of uh, maximum number of, 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 of nodes giving, being, being given the value one, and, and there can be ma minimal truth assignments in terms of having uh, most of the nodes having the truth value zero. And there are nice, optimal algorithms, uh, uh, global, global, um, global algorithms or local algorithms for settling um, the truth value um, of nodes in such a dependency graph. So what does that have to do with, uh, with what we are talking about here? Well, a lot. So you can recast model checking as, uh, as that of finding um, truth as, or, or assignments in dependency graph. So if this is your model, this is this Kripke structure here, and you want to check whether state R satisfies this, uh, this, um, this CTL formula here, um, in fact, let me skip this thing here, in fact you can construct this dependency graph here, and what are, the, what, what, what are these nodes here? The, the nodes here actually are pairs of a state of your Kripke structure and the formula, actually the overall formula itself or some subformula of that formula here. And this is, uh, this is the, the theorem that, that, that uh, shows why dependency graph is useful for model checking. Because if you want to check whether state S satisfies formula phi, then all you need to do is to look into the corresponding node in the dependency graph and check whether the truth assignment of that node has the value one. So there is this top node V1 here and it's, it has state R and it has the, the, the property of interest here. So you just compute the truth assignment to all the nodes here and you check whether this node gets the value one. So that's, uh, that's very nice. Uh, can we use this for 
can we use this uh, for our setting here now where we have a game and we have some properties. So what is it we want? Well, we would like to get, we can do that. So, <laughs> but not without some difficulties and some, some, uh, some, I would say significant problems that we are, that we are overcoming. I will say a bit about that in the next slide. But uh, at the bottom line, given a property, like a conjunction of these two uh, properties here and the game here, we can construct a dependency graph where essentially in all of these nodes here, you have a state and a property and uh, the node, so this dependency graph, and that node will, have, will get the assignment one precisely if there is a strategy so that if you, if you follow, follow that strategy from that state on, you will get a behavior satisfying the property of the node. So what are the difficulties we had in, in, in doing this? Well, uh, the difficulty is that we cannot just do what we did for model checking. So what did we do for model checking? Well, for model checking, we were, um, we were having this kind of let me say, principle for expand or for generating the dependency graph. So we were in, so if we had a node with the state S and the formula phi one and phi two, and in the model checking case, we wanted to know whether uh, S1 satisfies phi one and phi two, what we could do was that we could simply, uh, from this node here at this hyper edge, saying that S satisfies phi one and phi two, if S satisfies phi one and S satisfies phi two. And, sim and in a dual manner, uh, we could expand a node with the disjunction into two hyper edges and similar for other, for other properties. Now, the thing is that we would like that these rules would also be valid when it comes to synthesis. So the theorem that we are really going for is that <laughs> the, the truth value of a node should be one precisely if there is a strategy so that the behavior from, of, of the system from, from that state under that strategy satisfies, satisfies the property. So the bad news is that this uh, rule here is actually not valid. And if you think of it, you can also, and, and what you see here to the left is actually a counter example uh, to the validity or to the, to the soundness mm -hmm. of, this, of this rule here. But so, and, and I think if you, you, you can understand that there is a problem here. So what, because what we really want from this theorem is that, uh, that out of this, that should, there will be a strategy so that under that strategy, we satisfy phi both phi one and phi two, precisely if out of S there is a strategy so that we satisfy both phi one, and out of S there is a strategy so out of S we satisfy phi two. Now, the problem is that just because there is a strategy out of S satisfying phi one, and there, out of S there is a strategy out of S satisfying phi two, there might not be a, a, one strategy out of S that satisfies both phi one and phi two. Right? Because the strategy here might be different from the strategy here. And this is precisely what this example is, is an instance of. So you cannot just have this, I would say, um, inductive way of expanding nodes inductively in the structure of the formula. So we need to come up with something else. Uh, so what we do whenever we see a conjunction um, we, that needs to be satisfied is that we say, ah, oh, like we will not split now according to this conjunction here. Rather, we, we, um, we consider all the possible strategies that could be of relevance. And in this particular case, I didn't mention so much this game here, but clearly there are two controllable transitions. So either a strategy could point to S1 being uh, the strategic choice or S3 being the strategic choice. And giving that choice, of course, uh, uh, so if I choose S1, you will actually be left with a system with uh, two transitions, namely S1 and S2. And if you pick S3, there will be a system left with two, uh, with, with two transitions, namely S2 and S3. So given this strategic choice, uh, you better make sure that um, this entire conjunction is satisfied. So, so f f here, like all successors should satisfy Q or P and all successors should satisfy uh, not Q and P. And if you now follow that, follow these requirements, you actually get up, can uh, come up with this uh, unfolding of the dependency graph. 
And if you look into this, uh, this example here, you can see that all of these nodes here are actually false. So there is no strategy uh, for this example that meets this objective. But it also means that, um, that by rather than, you know, constructing the dependence graph on the structure of the, um, of the formula direct, directly, but dealing upfront with the conjunctions uh, supplemented with, first of all, putting formulas into a disjunctive normal form, uh, and of course also adding costs to the whole exercise, that we get uh, a method uh, that, uh, that actually allows us to uh, um, uh, reduce the problem of the existence of a winning strategy to that of uh, finding truth assignments in the dependence block. So um, maybe a bit, uh, bit uh, hard to, to, to understand. Uh, <clears throat> in, in full details, I, I only have 20 minutes and I, I think I will already spend a bit, a bit more. But uh, the main theorem that we have here on the synthesis part is that um, by this encoding in dependency graphs, we have a double exponential uh, time algorithm, so this is another an upper bound, and as an upper, as a lower bound by uh, using a reduction from succinct Hamiltonian path problem, uh, we, we we have also shown that uh, the synthesis problem is n x time hard. Uh, so for for future work, of course, we would very much like to close this complexity gap for the synthesis. Uh, we would very mu also much like um, to identify subclasses of the logic for which synthesis is is uh, just exponential time, not double exponential time. And I, we have um, ideas on that. Uh, we would like to, rather than just have a maximum fixed point interpretation, we would like to have alternating fixed points. And given that we have an encoding of the synthesis problem into dependency graphs, we have quite some tools that we could use to actually have, um, to actually implement uh, algorith synthesis algorithms based on this uh, encoding. So thank you very much. Uh, for this, and um, I'm, I would be happy to take some questions uh, at some point when we meet or you get in contact with me. Thank you.